This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcasts that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to Episode 14 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries, both natural and supernatural, from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mysterious Lost Tribes of Israel. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So uh, before we begin, as always, I want to remind folks to like Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on Facebook. We have a Facebook page for the show, to retweet the show on Twitter when you see it there, and to follow SQPN dot, uh, at SQPN on Twitter. Uh, leave us comments uh, on Facebook, on our, on our website, wherever you see the show. Subscribe to the show in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube. And if you subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell on, to get notifications when a new show uh, goes live. And uh, that way you'll be sure not to miss anything. And above all, please share the podcast with your friends to help us grow our community and to reach more listeners. Uh, Jimmy, could you uh, give us a word on our uh, giving campaign? Yeah. So uh, right now, StarQuest is doing a giving campaign, and we really need to hear from you uh, as part of that because uh, – StarQuest is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to bring people closer to Jesus. That's part of our name, StarQuest. It's a reference to the star of Bethlehem leading the wise men to Jesus. And we do that by exploring uh, various aspects of pop culture, including geek culture, science fiction, and mysteries like uh, here on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Uh, earlier this year, the board of StarQuest decided that if it if it was going to be more than just an organization that limped along with a single podcast, we needed to invest in the future and we needed to uh, produce uh, a suite of new podcasts. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is one of those. So the reason you're listening to this now is because of that decision. Now, investing in producing all these new shows to try to bring people closer to God means that we had to begin tapping our savings and they're at the point where they've become depleted. We have labor costs, we have hosting costs, we have um, technical costs, all kinds of different costs that we incur to bring these shows to you. And so now we need your help to uh, replenish our funds. And so um, the way you can help us out is by going to sqpn.com. That's uh, StarQuest Production Network, sqpn.com slash give, G-I-V-E, and uh, click on the Patreon button, become one of our monthly Patreon supporters. As always, on uh, uh, a Patreon campaign, we have some thank you gifts we'd like to send you. These uh, are tied to your favorite shows on StarQuest. We have some that are Doctor Who themed, some that are Star Trek themed, and some that are themed around the issues we discuss here on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. They include um, a, uh, a, a book. These are all books that, that, that I've read and can recommend to you. One of them is on Area 51, obviously a mysterious place. It's one of the better books on Area 51. Um, also, we have a book on the Fermi problem. Where are all the aliens? If the universe is teeming with life, where are all the aliens? And it's 75 different proposed solutions to that, some of which are very serious and some of which are very tongue in cheek. Also, there is an audio course, which is very good by uh, Rabbi Lawrence Schiffman on the Dead Sea Scrolls that uh, I found very profitable. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a fascinating topic, and I know that you'll find Rabbi Schiffman's course very interesting. So go to sqpn.com 
slash give if you like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and you want to keep hearing it and other StarQuest shows. Uh, now's the time we need to hear from you. Please remember us now that we're getting uh, to the end of the year and people are in a generous mood. Now's the time we need to hear from you. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, and folks, I just want to, uh, to remind you, please stick around to the end of the podcast. Don't uh, don't click off uh, after we're talk done talking about our topic, because, of course, we have some of our favorite parts of the show, our uh, mysterious feedback and mystery headlines uh, and mysterious feedback where we hear from you, the audience. We, we really appreciate uh, hearing from you. So uh, stick around. So let's get into our topic. I'm fascinated by this topic, and I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Um, the mysterious lost tribes of Israel. What what are we talking about the when we say the lost tribes of Israel? So originally there were 13 tribes, and they eventually got into space arcs and left the planet Cobol, <laughs> and 12 of them went to settle the colonies, and one of them became Ur. Oh, well, that's Battlestar Galactica. Sorry. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so originally the nation Israel had what are conventionally numbered as 12 tribes. Um, really, you can count them different ways. Um, the reason that they're numbered 12 is, well, 12 is a very important number in um, Israelite culture, but you it, it depends on exactly how you look at them. The 13th tribe, Levi, could be counted as one of the 12, but it was also kind of counted separately because it was a priestly tribe that the priests came from, and it didn't have its own territory the way the other 12 tribes did. Instead, um, to make up for separating out Levi, you had another tribe, the tribe of Joseph, that was kind of split in two based on Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But regardless of exactly how you count them, there were effectively 12 tribes. And uh, at a, some point at some point in history, 10 of them were taken into captivity and disappeared and became lost. So we're going to talk about what happened to them. Okay. And the names of the tribes of the, the 12 is based on the sons of uh, the, the, the patriarch pa Jacob patriarch or Israel. Israel. Yeah. Right. Uh, from and that was from the Bible, from Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. And that was common in uh, ancient uh, Near Eastern societies, they would often be named after a famous ancestor. That's why Israel is called Israel, because Israel was the other name of the patriarch Jacob. Okay. So th so that's what we're going to be talking about. So what is what are the claims? What do people say happened to the lost tribes of Israel? Well, there are a couple of claims. One of them is actually about the future. Uh, a bunch of people will claim that the return of the lost tribes is going to be a key event in Bible prophecy that remains in our future. And so we're going to be talking about that claim. The other claim in or that, and it's really a, a set of claims is that we can in some way identify the, the 10 lost tribes. And here there are a bunch of different kind of subclaims because people have identified the 10 lost tribes with all kinds of people all over the world. Some of the claims are really far fetched, but they were seriously made. Um, one uh, is that uh, the lost tribes went to Japan mm. and that Japanese people are descended from the lost tribes. Another is that Native Americans. Um, were descendants of the Lost Tribes. This was a theory, it was, it, it was initially called the Jewish Indian Theory. And the reason that it got started was because when the New World was discovered and it turned out all of these people are inhabitants of it, they, people in Europe needed an explanation for where did they come from? Because, you know, if we're all descended from Adam and Eve, these people had to come from somewhere. There were no known routes to the Americas from the old world. Uh, people didn't yet know about the Alaskan land bridge that used to exist, which is actually how the Native American population migrated from Asia to North America and then South America. Um, so one of the conjectures was, well, maybe they're descended from the Lost Tribes. And so this was uh, taken seriously by a lot of people at the time. And it later became influential in the religion of Mormonism, which claimed that or claims that uh, the lost tribes ended up m migrating to the Americas where they founded civilizations like the Lamanites, the Nephites, the Jaredites and the Mulekites, 
all of whom we have absolutely no archaeological evidence for. <laughs> um, and that uh, and Mormonism then influenced Glenn Larson, producer of the original version of Battlestar Galactica. So there's our Battlestar Galactica connection and why they have uh, a, a lost tribe situation going on on that show. Very interesting. Um, others, uh, others that have been claimed include the idea that British people are descended from the lost tribes. This is called the British Israel theory. And it was popular in the 19th century and kind of the early part of the 20th century in some circles. A related claim is that it's not British people specifically who are descended from the lost tribes, but Celtic people. And uh, recently there have been discussions of people in Ethiopia um, who uh, claim descent from the lost tribes. They're sometimes called falashas, Although uh, um, that term is often considered pejorative, uh, they prefer these days to be called Beta Israel or House of Israel. And, um, and they, like other people from Ethiopia, they're sub-Saharan African, so they, they're uh, black in appearance, but they claim Israelite descent. And then there are other groups as well all over the world. It's hard to find a group that nobody has claimed to be descended from the Lost Tribes. <laughs> Okay, and then there are there are those who look at all these claims and they say no, no. So what do they say? What is the counterclaims? Well, there are several. Uh, one is that the return of the lost tribes is not a key event in biblical prophecy; that it's not going to happen. It's not on God's timetable. Uh, it's also claimed they're irretrievably lost, and that uh, we'll never be able to figure them out, that they're not plausibly to be identified with any specific group of people, and certainly not the more fanciful ones that we've discussed, like you know people from Japan or Native Americans or what have you. Um, also, some people have kind of a different claim, and they'll say that these tribes were never really lost, mm -hmm. and we'll get into some of the details of, of that claim as well. Okay, so... What what do we know? What what is what do we have from uh, from history that tells us what what happened to the? Our principal source on this is, are the historical books of the Old Testament, and they reveal that Israel was originally a tribal confederacy that consisted of basically twelve tribes, depending on how they were counted. These this uh, confederacy then united under a single king in a period called the United Monarchy that began, it's a little bit before 1000 BC. Uh, the first king was King Saul. He was replaced by King David, who was replaced by his son Solomon. And then um, because of Solomon's sins, God sent a prophet who said, I'm going to rip, I'm going to break the kingdom because of your sins. I'm going to take 10 tribes away from your dynasty and I'm only going to leave you two. But because David pleased me so much, I'm not going to do it in your day. I'm going to do it in the day of your son. So when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. He was the last king of the United Monarchy. And around the year 930 BC, the northern 10 tribes seceded from the southern kingdom. Uh, so... Um, Yes, in Israel, the north seceded from the south. <laughs> and um, and so the 10 northern tribes formed what became known as the nation of Israel, while the two southern tribes became known as the kingdom of Judah. And Judah continued under the Davidic dynasty of kings, and Israel set up its own uh, line of kings, actually several different dynasties. Uh, the two nations had kind of difficult relations for about a couple of centuries. Sometimes they were allied, sometimes they were opposed. Um, and then Israel was conquered by an emerging power in the ancient Near East, the Assyrian Empire. Assyria, if you want to know where that is, think kind of Iran, uh, little parts of Iraq too, but Iran basically. And um, and so they conquered Israel around 723 BC. And as part of a Syrian policy, they would deport people as kind of a, a, a way of pacifying their empire. They would move people out of their original homeland so they weren't in their native stronghold anymore. And so they took 
a lot of people from the nation of Israel and moved them to other lands and replaced them from settlers from elsewhere in the Assyrian Empire. And so that's how the 10 northern tribes got moved out of the Holy Land. Eventually, um, Judah, the southern kingdom, was also conquered by another emerging power, the Babylonians, um, who who conquered the Assyrians. And if you want to know where Babylon was, that's, I think, Iraq. Um, and so the Babylonians conquered uh, Judah around 587, beginning what's known as the Babylonian exile. They also deported many people from Judah, but eventually they sent them back, or many of them got sent back. They were allowed to return by the Persians who had conquered the Babylonians, and that ended the Babylonian exile. But the claim is, that um, the northern tribes who had been deported by the Assyrians never had their exile in, that they stayed where they were, and uh, eventually they intermingled and knowledge of their identity was lost. And uh, just to clarify, so because it's interesting to me that the, the, the lost tribes are Israel. They're the ones who disappeared. It's Judah that continued, right. um, although we've always call the the Jewish nation Israel. Today, Israel, yeah. 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 So today, it, it, even though uh, it, the origin of the word Jew, by the way, is from Judah. Right. Um, so the that's why Jewish people are called Jews, is because most of them are descendants of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, but despite that, the modern state of Israel chose to name itself after the whole shebang. Okay. And is the Jerusalem was in Judah, right? Correct. Yes, okay. that was David's capital. Okay, so um, we, we it's also always, really crowded. Yes, right. Mm. So we uh, we always approach this from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. So it sort of makes sense to start with uh, the faith perspective. What is uh, what does faith tell us about this idea of lost tribes of Israel? Well, um, so the first claim we mentioned kind of from a faith perspective is that the lost tribes are going to return someday and that this is a big event in the future of biblical prophecy. That's something that's debated. Um, you'll find theologians on both sides of that issue. Uh, some of them will say, yeah, <clears throat> um, the lost tribes will definitely return. Others will say, no, it's really not going to happen. Or others will say, we're not real sure. It might happen. It might not. Uh, there are passages in the Old Testament prophets that at least suggest that the the Israelite tribes will return at some point, but there are a, there are some different ways of looking at those passages. And so people who would say they're not going to return have some options in terms of how they would look at those passages. One of them is a view that you might call prophetic cancellation. Um, this is something we see in the book of Jonah, where God initially commissions the prophet Jonah to go to this Babylonian city of, uh, of Nineveh, which today is Mosul, Iraq, mm -hmm. and he's to preach the doom of Nineveh. But when he does that, the Ninevites all repent, and God then cancels the doom. He, he says, I'm not going to, since you've repented, I'm not going to doom you. And um, and so this shows that even when God has a prophecy announced, later factors like repentance or failure to repent can change that. God can rescind a plan. Okay. Um, and this is something that's made explicit in Jeremiah 18. If you look at Jeremiah 18, uh, 18 verses 7 to 10, God is uh, talking to Jeremiah and he says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. So that's like what he said to Nineveh. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil that I intended to do it, to do to it. And so that's like exactly mm -hmm. what we see happening in Jonah. But then he says the reverse. He says, and if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, like what he said would happen to the Israelite tribes upon returning, he's going to build them up as return them to their land, plant them in their land again. And if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, 
then I will repent of the good which I had intended to do to it. And so whether God prophesies good or ill for a nation, how that nation reacts can affect whether he ends up fulfilling that. Uh, he may change his plans based on uh, the nation's repentance or failure to repent. Um, now, obviously, from a modern perspective, that raises questions about, well, what about divine foreknowledge and doesn't God know the future? And yes, we know that um, that God does know the future. And so he ultimately knows what the outcome is going to be. He knew when he sent Jonah to Nineveh that the Ninevites would repent. But the fact remains, if they hadn't, and if he hadn't warned them, causing them to repent, then they would have been judged. So um, so it's all part of divine providence. But just because you've got a prophecy saying something doesn't mean that how you react isn't going to affect that. And so as early as the first century, Jewish scholars seem to have debated exactly what would happen regarding these prophecies concerning the lost tribes of Israel. Um, the Mishnah, uh, which is an early uh, re recording of the unwritten traditions of the Pharisees, uh, records a discussion about whether the ten tribes are going to come back. Um, Rabbi Akiva, who was born around AD 50, so he was born just after the time of Jesus, um, according to the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva says the ten tribes will not return, um, as the verse in Deuteronomy says, and the Lord uprooted them from their land with fury, anger, and great wrath. He cast them to another land as it is to this day. Just as a day passes and it will never return, so too they will be exiled never to return, according to Rabbi Akiva. According to Rabbi Eliezer, however, um, just as a day is followed by darkness and the light later returns, so too, although it will become dark for the ten tribes, God will ultimately take them out of their darkness. And then the Talmud, which is a commentary on the Mishnah, um, ha has a third option that's attributed to Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda from Akko. And according to him, he kind of fused the viewpoints of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer, and he said, if their deeds are as this day, they will not return. Otherwise, they shall. So according to Rabbi Shimon, um, if they continued to do evil in the land that God had sent them to, they're going to stay there. But if they repent, then he will bring them back and plant them again in the land of Israel. So you had this debate going on in the early centuries among Jewish sages about exactly what would happen with respect to these prophecies. And some rabbis said they may be canceled by the failure of the Israelites to repent. So the prophecies are that they will come back as it, it, in that there would be a, a, a grand meaning in their return. Um, but though the, the, that, Jewish... that they would li literally happen, but they that they would literally come back just like the southern Ju uh, Israelites, the Jews, came back from the Babylonian exile to the Holy Land. And and then and, the, the Jewish scholars are then saying uh, that you know that that sort of depends. It depends on right. what they're doing wherever they are now. Right. Do uh, do they follow God in that land, or do they give in to pagan customs or things like that? Right. Um, so that's one option that people who say they're not going to return have to deal with these passages. Another is what you might call a spiritual fulfillment view. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, a number of Old Testament prophecies, they seem to have spiritual fulfillments in Christianity, um, like the prophecy of the new covenant that God would make with with uh, Israel, that's fulfilled in the new covenant made by Christ. And so some people have come along and say, well, um, these lands were evangelized. Uh, the lands that the lost tribes got taken to were evangelized. Some of them uh, converted to Christianity, and therefore they were spiritually reunited with Christianity, the, spirit, the spiritual Israel. And so uh, they were uh, they were reunited with their people on this grander spiritual level. And we shouldn't be looking for 
a literal geographical fulfillment of these prophecies, but a higher spiritual fulfillment of these prophecies in the Christian faith. So that's another way that people have of looking at them. Okay. Then there's a third way, which not too many people have explored, but it's basically this. The prophecies were fulfilled literally and geographically, and it's already happened. Hmm. Um, but a lot of people just didn't take note of it. And so uh, we're going to talk about that in our section on the reason perspective. Okay. So let's let's go to that then. What is... Um... From the perspective of reason, from science and uh, in historical research, what does that tell us about these lost tribes of Israel and whether they'll return? Yeah, well, the first thing it tells us is we shouldn't identify them with many of the pro of the proposed groups who are just from the wrong parts of the world. Um, they're not the P Japanese people are not descended from the lost tribes. Native Americans are not descended from the lost tribes. They're their own peoples with their own history and their own heritage, and we shouldn't be trying to collapse them into, into another people's history and heritage. And we know that because of the genetic testing and history, and yeah. there were there there weren't. I mean, Native Americans were here thousands right. of years before uh, the tribes went lost, and um, and so were Japanese people. And, and people uh, could not have traveled, even if they were merged into those groups, people just didn't travel those distances uh, like that right. in, in those ancient right. days. Okay. Yeah, uh, certainly not in those numbers. Um, there, There's this other perspective, though, I mentioned earlier that says, well, the tribes weren't really lost. And there's a couple of, there's more to be said for this view than a lot of people realize. Um, in the first place, the so the northern kingdom of Israel had its capital in Samaria. Samaria was the name of a city. It later became the name of a region, but it was originally the name of a city. And just like Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. So Jerusalem's capital was southern kingdom. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. And when the Assyrians deported many of the um, of of the of the northern tribes, they didn't deport everybody. They left some people there, and those people um, are the forebears of the Samaritans mm. who we read about in the New Testament. There's also some inbreeding with the new settlers that came in, but they're also descendants of the uh, of the northern tribes, and so the Samaritans who exist to this day. There are still Samaritans. They're a distinct cultural group in Israel. They're a small one. There's only a few hundred, but they're a distinct cultural group to this day. They still live around Mount Gerizim, where their temple was. And every year at Passover, they go up and slaughter lambs uh, hmm. in 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 the ruins of their temple. Um, you can see pictures of that online if you want. Uh, the Samaritans are like, well, hey guys, what about us? I mean, we were never lost. We're descendants of the original northern tribes. Right. So that that's one challenge to the idea that the tribes were lost. Another challenge is, well, we're told exactly where they went. Um, it doesn't just say the Assyrians took them and we don't know where they went. Instead, if you look at 2 Kings 17, verse 6, it says, In the ninth year of King Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, that's the capital, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. So we're told three places, Hala, uh, the Habor, which is a river, and also the cities of the Medes. And we know where these three places were. Hala was near Nineveh or Mosul, Iraq. Um, and uh, that's something that's also confirmed in the book of Tobit. If you look at Tobit 1 1, this is in the Catholic Bible, uh, Tobit is speaking and he says, Now, when I was carried away captive, he's from one of the northern tribes. Tobit says, um, When I was carried away captive to Nineveh, all my brethren and my relatives ate the food of the Gentiles. So to Tobit's a faithful Israelite who was deported to Nineveh. That confirms the statement that they were sent to Hala. The second place, the Habor River, uh, or the Habor River, flows into the Euphrates, and it's in northern Mesopotamia, 
near the city of Gozen. So that's, again, you want to think northern Iraq is where we're talking about. And then the cities of Media, that's the Median Empire from which the Medes emerge, uh, that's northwestern Iran. And we also have uh, a reference to that in Tobit as well. So if you look at Tobit 114, Tobit says uh, that I used to go into Media and once at Rajas in Media, I left 10 talents of silver in trust with Gabael, the brother of Gabriah. So this is one of his fellow Israelites he left some money with who was living in Media. Um, so basically, we know where the Lost Tribes went. They went to northern Iraq and Iran. And the thing is, there are still, to this day, some Jewish enclaves in Iraq and Iran. And other Jews, um, uh, so so those Jewish enclaves, now today they're called Jews because of their religion, but that's a name that came to be associated with their religion. In terms of their of their genetic heritage, since they're Jewish and they're in the area that the lost tribes were deported to, they may just be the continuation of... Uh, genetically, of those original Israelite communities that have subsequently come to be called Jews as the name Jew has been attached to the religion rather than the people specifically. So those Jewish enclaves may be the lost tribes. Also, because we mentioned the gospel has been preached in these areas, well, there are lots of Christians in these areas too. Many of the um, uh, many of the people in the area converted to Christianity. So you have Chaldean Catholics and Assyrian Orthodox Christians who are genetically from this northern Iraq, northern uh, Iran area. They may be the lost tribes. Um, here where I live in uh, El Cajon, California, where Catholic Answers is based, our town is like 25 percent uh, Chaldean. And uh, we even have one of the two Chaldean dioceses in North America is based here in El Cajon because there's so many Chaldeans here. I may be living in, and many Catholic Answers employees who, have, who are or have been Chaldean, they may be genetically descended from the Lost Tribes and not know it. Wow. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's not at all implausible. Um, also, because they've gone all over the world, people from that part of the world, some of whom have resettled in Israel based on the Israelite law of return, some of them may have returned already to Israel under the Israelite law of return, even though they're genetically descended from the 10 northern tribes. Hmm. So that's a possibility. Um, also, if we think about the first century, there you know, when the New Testament was being written, these tribes weren't even considered lost then. Uh, people knew where they were. Uh, we see this, for example, in a book called The Lives of the Prophets, um, which is a Jewish work from the early first century. It, it basically is what it says. It's a, it's a kind of biography of the Old Testament prophets. And in the section on Ezekiel, this is Lives of the Prophets 317, it says, Ezekiel foretold that on, he's talking about the northern tribes. Ezekiel foretold that on their account, the people would not return to its land, but would be in media until the consummation of their error. So they're going to be in media. That's where these tribes are going to be until the consummation of their error. So hmm. if they repent, they get to come back. Josephus, the Jewish historian from the late first century, in his Antiquities of the Jews, and if you want to look the, look this up, it's Antiquities of the Jews, Book 11, Chapter 5, Section 2, Subsection 133. He says, the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates until now and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated by numbers. So he says there's a whole bunch of them. They're living on the other side of the Euphrates, which again points to that northern Iraq, Iran area. Mm. Also, in the New Testament, we have references to them. In, at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, uh, if you look at Luke 2.36, we meet Anna. This is when Jesus is being brought to the temple as a baby. Anna, the prophetess, is there, and we're told she is an Asherite. She's a daughter of a man named Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, which was one of the ten northern tribes. And Luke presents this as if it's a totally normal thing. 
So she's an Asherite. She's here in Jerusalem. Paul in Acts 26, 7 is talking and he refers to our 12 tribes and what the hopes of our 12 tribes are. Uh, James, in the very first epistle, verse of his epistle, James addresses the epistle to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. And so he's got, some people have looked at that and said, oh, this is figurative for the entire church. But given that we've got Asherites and other, and living in Jerusalem and first century uh, sources like Josephus and Lives of the Prophets talking about these tribes, as if we know where they are, there's no need to take James's address figuratively, it makes it makes all the sense in the world just to say, no, he means 12 Jewish tribes. That's who he's writing to, at least the Christians among them. So they really weren't considered lost in this age. Mm. And then there's the fact that the Old Testament records that some of them actually did return to the land. This gets into the uh, historical fulfillment possibility that I mentioned. If you look at First Chronicles uh, chapter 9, the first three verses of First Chronicles 9, <clears throat> it says that all Israel was enrolled. It's talking about the end of the Babylonian exile. And it says all is Israel was enrolled by genealogies, and these are written in the book of the kings and of Israel. And Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. Now the first began to dwell again in their possessions in the, their cities. The first to dwell again in their possessions in their cities were Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the temple servants, and some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh dwelt in Jerusalem. Ephraim and Manasseh were two of the northern tribes. So at the end of the Babylonian exile, some of the northern tribes actually did start to come back. And so that's another possible fulfillment for these prophecies. They may have already happened. Um, but at any point, many of them remained in the, uh, in the area to which they've been deported. Some of them may have migrated elsewhere. And at some point, even if they weren't completely lost, their identity became indistinct. Okay. And, and that's a fairly common historical event where tribes or groups that were once distinct uh, because of various reasons, whether war, famine, or whatever, become merged or melded into other cultures yeah. around them. Yeah, that's and in fact, the 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 fact that that has not happened to Jews after two thousand years has been cited as many as a sign of divine providence yeah. and a kind of miraculous preservation of the Jewish people, right. despite I mean, them not not having a homeland. Right, right, exactly. Uh, I mean, the, nearly every other culture that has that's happened to to them, but except for that one. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, so how do you know what? How do how do we, from a reason perspective, how do we settle this? Uh, you know, what what do we? Well, for the first time, we have a way to do that, or at least the beginnings of the way to do that, and that is DNA. Um, as, <clears throat> as I'm sure everybody in the audience knows, you can get a 23andMe kit and spit in a tube and send it off in the mail, and they will send you back a report on where your ancestors came from. And as more and more people <clears throat> do that, we build up a bigger and bigger database, and we learn more about how the different lines of uh, human lineage are connected and where and when they, they diverge from each other. It allows us to fill in a bigger picture of how human historical migrations happen. And as that picture fills in, it may well be possible to say, okay, this person is descended from one of the northern tribes. Currently, there are some genes that are uh, considered possible markers for um, being related to, I mean, we it, it, we definitely have markers for this person is of Middle Eastern descent. And we have some markers for like this person is of Jewish descent, either Sephardic or what have you. Um, but as we fill in the database, it may be possible to specifically identify what tribe people may have been associated with, or at least establish a probability that this person or this population is descended in some way from the 10 northern tribes, even if we can't determine a specific tribe. Okay. And from the, from the, again, from this perspective, you mentioned earlier the law of return. 
Oh, how does that yeah. affect this? Okay, so um, <clears throat> the in 1950, Israel, the state of Israel, established a law that said if you're a Jew, you have a right to return to Israel. This was one of the ways of dealing with anti-Semitic persecution around the world. They wanted to establish Israel as a safe homeland for Jewish people so that no matter where you are in the world, you could come here and have a homeland. And in 1970, they modified the law to include um, like w wives and children and things like that as well. Um, but basically, the law of return is a way of of uh, allowing Jewish people back to the land. Now, if we at some point are able to identify people who came from the northern tribes, then they could potentially invoke the law of return. And that's one way that if the prophecies do have a future fulfillment, that's something that could play a role in it. You mm. could have people say, hey, my 23 and me shows I'm a descendant of the northern tribes and I want to go back to Israel. Now, there are likely to be restrictions on that because one of the things that's commonly required is you have to be not just ethnically Jewish, but religiously Jewish. Okay. Um, and in fact, that's something that um, uh, that plays a role here. In fact, it kind of gets us into a larger question. In, in Jewish circles, the debate, there's a debate that's often called who is a Jew? And it deals with the complexities of Jewish identity and, you know, and heritage and to what extent is it, uh, is it biological? To what extent is it religious? Um, to what extent is it cultural? Because you can have people who are not Jewish at all in terms of their prior culture or in terms of their biological heritage, but who then convert to Judaism and, and they're Jews religiously. You can also have people who may be descended of Jewish parents, but say, I'm not a Jew, I'm a Christian, or I'm a Muslim, or what have you. And so the who is a Jew um, debate is something that's kind of a live issue, especially when it comes to the law of return. Because like many Russian Jews, they were ethnically Jewish and so would be persecuted in Russia, even though they were Christian by faith. And so how does the law of return apply to them? If they're experiencing persecution from being Jews, but they're not religiously Jews, what do you do with that? And, um, and so that's one of the ways the debate is applied. Now, in terms of lost tribes, well, um, there have, you know, it, it would be possible for uh, someone in the near future to take a DNA test and find out, well, I've got a teeny little bit of uh, lost tribe DNA, maybe one in 1,024 <laughs> of my ancestors was from the lost tribes. Do I get to t claim tribal identity on that basis? Rip from the headlines, and, folks. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the Jewish religious authorities in, 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 in Israel would be the ones to adjudicate that. Uh, just like here in America, Native American tribal authorities are the ones to adjudicate tribal affiliation. Um, it's not simply a matter of DNA. And we see some interesting applications of that regarding, uh, potentially regarding the lost tribes. For example, I mentioned Beta Israel in Ethiopia. Um, they have, in terms of DNA tests, it's like maybe these people have a little bit of Jewish DNA back there somewhere. Um, it's it, it's not great DNA evidence, but they're Jewish in their religious practice. And so the authorities in Israel said, OK, the law of return applies to them. Hmm. They get to come back. And a lot of uh, Beta Israel or a number of people from Beta Israel have moved back to Israel. Um, then there's a phenomenon we see in the Old Testament where you could be adopted into one of the tribes, even if you weren't biologically from that tribe. This is a process that occurs in, um, in ancient Near Eastern and even modern Near Eastern <clears throat> tribal societies. It's called genealogization. What happens is if you agree to become a member of this tribe and to follow its laws and live as one of its members, you get posthumously adopted into its genealogy. 
And we seem to see an example of this in the Old Testament with Caleb. Caleb was one of the two good spies at the time of, of the Exodus. And we're told in uh, some passages that he's a Kenizzite, which would mean he's not an Israelite. But he's also depicted as belonging to the tribe of Judah. And it looks like what happened was he was originally born a Kenizzite, but he con he converted and became an adopted Judahite. And so he was adopted into the genealogy of the tribe of Judah, because in a tribal society, you have to belong to some tribe. If you're becoming one of us, you're becoming part of one of our tribes. And so he was able to do that, even though he didn't have any, as far as we know, uh, Israelitish DNA. We see something similar with two of the northern tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. They were both sons of Joseph, so they had half Israelite DNA, but their mother was an Egyptian. Mm. So they were also half Egyptian, but that didn't stop them from uh, becoming the patriarchs of two of the northern tribes. So you don't have to have pure DNA in order to have tribal affiliation. Mm. And that leads us to a group uh, in Northeast India called the Bene Menashe, which means the sons of Manasseh. Uh, this group claims to be descendants of the tribe of Manasseh. And in 2005, one of the chief rabbis of Rome granted them status as Jews under the law of return. So they could come back to Israel if they want. They're officially considered Jews eligible for return. But they're from India, and they don't have good DNA evidence of being descended from anybody Jewish. Um, in fact, they were animists before they were converted to Christianity in the 19th century by Welsh Baptist and evangelical missionaries, and only after that did they become Jewish and started claiming to be descendants of Manasseh. So mm -hmm. they don't seem to have a genetic link, but they're still considered by the authorities um, in Israel to be eligible for return. And so this is yet another way that you could potentially have this prophecy being fulfilled even without a genetic component. Wow. <laughs> it's a very complex issue. So yeah, who is a Jew gets fascinating. Yeah. So I mean, fr frankly, my my grandfather was Jewish, and uh, uh -huh. and so that this is fascinating on a personal level. You know that the, the, the uh -huh. idea. But uh, my mother, well, you know, my grandmother, and and thus my mother were both uh, Catholic because my mom was a girl and not a boy. If he, if she had been born a boy. She would have been considered Jewish, and so that's that's the sort of thing that I mean. Frankly, this is one of the reasons, like you said, why the Jews have uh, lasted as a distinct cultural uh, uh, group for two thousand years, uh, despite not having a homeland for most of that. Uh, so mm -hmm. Fascinating. So, what's the bottom line here on the lost tribes of Israel, the mystery surrounding them? Well, the bottom line, in my view, is that the issue of whether they return is un is unresolved. There are different ways of looking at that to say it, you could look at those passages and say, yep, they're definitely going to return in the future. You could uh, look at them and say, well, it was canceled. You could look at them and say it was fulfilled spiritually. You could say it was fulfilled historically. You could say it is being fulfilled now through some of these law of return things. Um, it is, uh, so that one's unclear, but I think there are good odds that in the near future, meaning within our lifetimes, we'll be able to identify some people who are descended from them, even if that doesn't fully resolve the question of whether they would be counted as Israelites from a biblical perspective. I think we're going to have the DNA tools we need to say, yep, you've got an ancestor back there who is from the Northern tribes. Interesting. Where can people look for more and, 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 and probably most of those people are going to be in uh, in northern Iraq and Iran or have migrated, had their ancestors migrate from there. OK, uh, so if, if folks want to find out more about the, this topic, what, what uh, do you have any resources for them? Yeah, I've uh, in the show notes, I'll have a, a link to the Lost Tribes article on Wikipedia. 
I'll also have a, uh, a link to a NOVA transcript. NOVA, the PBS science program, did an episode on uh, this a number of years ago. And so I have a link to the transcript of that. And then I've also got a link to a book by the British scholar Richard Balcom called Gospel Women. And uh, it's, as the name would suggest, it's a study of women in the Gospels. And he's got a fascinating chapter on Anna the Asherite. And in it, he discusses uh, the biblical and extra biblical evidence from Jewish sources about the lost tribes and what their status was uh, at that time in history and how they weren't lost at all then. So if you want to read a scholarly discussion, uh, a really good scholarly discussion of what the historical evidence inside and outside the Bible tells us, check out Gospel Women by Richard Balcom. Excellent. So let's move on to our uh, mysterious feedback. Uh, we're, this week we're talking about feedback from our episode on Tunguska, the event in uh, the Soviet Union, or over the time, I think it was uh, Siberian Russia. Uh, and we have our first comment comes from Claire Kappenman on YouTube. Uh, she writes, I remember hearing that the events of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis could be explained by a Tunguska-like event. Do you think this is a credible theory, Jimmy? It's possible. Also, uh, another proposed explanation for the Sodom and Gomorrah events would be a volcanic event. Um, there are volcanoes in Israel um, and surrounding areas, and actually events like Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood have been uh, have on the natural level explanations. Now, the divine level is a separate thing, but on right. the natural level, um, explanations for them have been proposed, including uh, known major volcanic explosions in the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, the next feedback comes from uh, BP26P on YouTube, who says, uh, how would a Tunguska-like event impact unfallen humans at ground zero? Would they be able to shrug it off like Kryptonians on Earth? Um, my first instinct is to say it would be more like Daxamites because Daxamites had a vulnerability to an existing substance, lead, and uh, the unfallen humans would have had an ex uh, a, um, a vulnerability to an existing substance, uh, namely the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> um, but uh, that's a little into the weeds, comic book wise. Um, I would say that we really don't know. Uh, Theologians have drawn a distinction between existing in a glorified state and in an unfallen state. Mm. Um, Jesus and Mary did not have the stain of original sin, and so they were unfallen, but they um, were clearly vulnerable. Because yeah. you could nail Jesus to a cross and he could die. Right. Um, he wasn't yet glorified in immortal life the way he would be after the resurrection. And so you could say unfallen humans underneath a Tunguska event, unless they're in a glorified state, they're going to be as mortal as anybody else. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, I, I, I love the way our, our, our listeners kind of come up with these very interesting extensions of the scenario, uh, the, these theoretical. I, I love that theoretical stuff. Yeah. Um, and then our last uh, p uh, bit of feedback this week comes from RCS Curtis on Facebook, who simply says, uh, uh, you know, a comment on our uh, the posting of our time guest. Uh, Sweet. This has become the best part of Friday. Uh, That's really nice to hear. Yeah, I agree, uh, Arceus Curtis. <laughs> it is the best part of Friday. So, and then uh, our mystery headlines of the week, Jimmy, can you give us uh, those this week? Yeah, so I have two of them. Uh, the first one is kind of a geological mystery. And it's it, we actually understand this, but it still is, comes across as mysterious. Um, there's a man in Michigan, and I've got a link to a story, and it includes video. Um, but he's found these uh, rocks called Uperlites. Uh, he named them that. Uh, Uper is a nickname for people from upper the Upper Peninsula in Peninsula in Michigan. The UP, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so since they're found there, um, he has nicknamed. He's called these rocks Uperlites. And what's neat about them is you shine an ultraviolet light on them and they glow. Ooh. And he he will like go out on the beach of I guess Lake Superior with an ultraviolet light, and it'll take people out with ultraviolet lights. And you'll be walking along, looking at the rocks, and all of a sudden, one of them is just glowing amidst all these other rocks that aren't. And it looks really cool. Um, I remember 
um, as a boy going to the University of Arkansas Museum and seeing well, they had a room with like a case of rocks that were that would fluoresce under UV light and you'd press a button and it would darken the room and light up the rocks. And it was always so cool to see how they changed uh, appearance and how they would glow under UV light. And hmm. so if you want to take a look at these Uper lights, which you can also, I guess, buy on eBay, uh, you, if you want your own Uper light, um, <laughs> check out this uh, link we've provided in the show notes. The other story I've got is on capturing space junk with a net. Nice. Um, as as satellites and are up there and as uh, space stations get hold and things like that, we have a problem with space junk accumulating in orbit. It poses a danger. Uh, to people who are in orbit and to satellites that are in orbit. So we need ways to clean it up. And uh, one company recently tested a net that they would fire at space junk, and then the net and the space junk would fall down from orbit and burn up. Uh, so that's uh, one way they're looking at doing it. They're also looking at harpooning space junk. So if you want to find out about all that, check out the link to the space junk story. The space whalers uh, would be. It, yeah. Now that's a job description. After the giant white piece of space junk, <laughs> Moby Dick. <laughs> all right. So uh, that's it for us this week. So I just want to uh, finish off by reminding you to like, comment, subscribe, get notifications and share the podcast with folks and to send us feedback. What do you think about? the mysterious lost tribes of israel do you have uh, something you want to say about that um and uh give us your feedback at sqpn.com if you go there and you find uh, the, the the link to this show and uh leave a comment there or on the jimmy akins mysterious world facebook page or you can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com uh, I want to remind you, as Jimmy mentioned at the beginning, if you want to support the show and the work of SQPN and ensure that we keep uh, 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 on our ongoing work and keep producing podcasts like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Don't talk too fast. And uh, mm-hmm. also find uh, relevant links from our discussion, like the uh, resources and the headlines, uh, on our show notes at sqpn.com. Until next time, Jimmy Akin. Thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. This is Dom Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com slash give.